Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining this learning experience brought to you by PortWorks. My name is Cody and welcome back to TechStrong Learning. Before we dive into things, I have just a couple of notes I'd like to review with everyone. First of all, we are recording our session today. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to watch again at a later point in time, or of course, if you would like to share this with your team, we'll be making the on-demand version available to you via email shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, if you'd like to get engaged, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first way is to use the chat tab on the right side of your screen. So when you find that chat tab, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you are joining from. Um, so I'm seeing Orlando, Atlanta, Texas, Portugal, Utah, Hungary, and Columbus, Ohio. We've got people all over. Now, if you have any specific questions, we do want you to submit those questions to the Q&A tab, which is to the right of that chat section. Sending in your chat or your questions to the Q&A just helps us keep organized. And we know there will be lots of questions. We want to be able to answer as many as we can today. Um, additionally, if you jump to the, oh, we don't have any handouts available yet, but I will update you at the end of the program if we do get any of those added. And we will be selecting two very lucky winners, two of our most engaged attendees to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So ways to uh, qualify are to send in chats, questions, and of course, fill out our post webinar survey. So our discussion today is top trends that will shape data on Kubernetes in 2024. I'm joined today by John o Owings, Director of Cloud Native Strategy at Portworks. And I'm also joined today by Justin Fredrickson, Director of Cloud Native Architects at Portworks. So John and Justin, thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, Justin, do you wanna go ahead and dive us into our first slide? Absolutely, and uh, thanks so much for that warm introduction. And we're really excited to talk to you guys today. And hopefully this uh, session is valid valuable for, for each of you all attending. And we really do hope that you uh, take advantage of the opportunity to to drive some questions at us that probably make the, the content a little bit more richer and um, more uh, beneficial for you. And we'll have plenty of time at the end of the conversation to, to dive into that. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping on my, my side. I do have a, a little bit of uh, an agenda here. Obviously we went through the uh, intros. Uh, next thing uh, that I'll go through is just, um, I'll set some overall impressions of what I've seen uh, throughout the year uh, based upon customer interactions, attendance at various conferences and, uh, and shows. Uh, as well as uh, just what we're seeing directly in in our sales motion with customers um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we'll round that out with some just general observations we're seeing uh, in, in emerging trends as well uh, that we're seeing uh, from, from those interactions uh, around in general, the entirety of the space, whether it's uh, Kubernetes, uh, the DevOps space, uh, or now what is more commonly referred to as platform engineering. And then we'll leave uh, plenty of time for questions and answer and resources and we're really excited to, to get started. So um, uh, the next slide, I'm going to pass over here to, to J.O. just to kind of set the table a little bit about how we got to this place uh, with regards to data on Kubernetes. So, so take it away, J.O. So, yeah, I mean, thank you, uh, J. Fred, for the <laughs> awesome intro and uh, setting the table. But as we look at kind of the past, <laughs> every transition from, from mainframe to open systems, there was a certain amount of innovation when it came to data. Like how do we how do we actually mount data now that was in the mainframe to the open systems? How do we protect it? How do we replicate it? Um, and then the same thing happened again with virtual machines. And there was APIs created, you know, with VMware to back it up or replicate, and all kinds of tools uh, around that. And now we are set and seeing this next transition into containers with, with you know, obviously Kubernetes being something that is a bigger deal, right? A lot of people are taking advantage of that. Uh, we see the numbers of people running in production growing greatly. That is a trend for next year too. We'll see more and more people uh, moving their workloads into production, but what to do with data. Um, the in the past, that was something that, you know, hey, we'll push that off to someone else. We don't have time to do that. Like the founders of, or the, the engineers who made Kubernetes said, we just decided to skip that part and give it to something else. Well, 
over the last five, six years, a lot of people have spent a lot of effort <laughs> in order to make this a real thing because we want the advantages of containers, but also for the things that have data, like databases and queuing systems and all the stuff that developers want to actually be able to go fast. So, you know, what do we do? You know, what do we do around that? That I, I'm pointing at the, the arrow, that arrow that's going to this, <laughs> I guess it's a picture of a container, like it's a cloud and a and a, a disk thing, but mainly what it is is you know what what's changed, and that's what we call data on Kubernetes. Is how how is that's what these trends are. That's what we're going to be talking about today, and kind of how that affects your workloads and things that you're running, whether it's virtual machines, you know, new mach new workloads in the cloud, hybrid, multi cloud, all those fun things. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jay. That's a, that's a great start. Uh, and one important to note here is that. Um, we're not even, I and mean, I didn't even think about it until you started talking, but like nobody's questioning the the notion of data on Kubernetes at this point. Um, I, I know that there's been at times, uh, you know, when 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 the CNCF first launched and, uh, you know, when, when Google was, was taking this out of incubation, uh, there was definitely a thought that, you know, Kubernetes was best suited for ephemeral workloads. And, you know, if, if you're building it at web scale, uh, you, you know, stateful components is, weren't, weren't, weren't really relevant, but yet we, we really have seen a full-on transition associated with that, and um, I think some of the things that 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 come about when we start to recognize that that data and and stateful workloads are 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 de facto norm within the space is that it's going to stretch elements of the skill set associated with the individuals that have been operating within Kubernetes for quite some time, and uh, they're going to have to have much more architectural consideration around: Do I have enough performance to run? A, uh, a highly performant uh, Kafka workload. Uh, if I'm running a, a complex uh, site reliability engineering uh, workload with lots of observability and monitoring, say using Elastic, um, you know those are workloads that require significant consideration around how to how to run. And um, these are part of the trends that we're starting to see uh, as as people are starting to tackle those bigger challenges. So um, just to move the, the deck a little forward a little bit forward just to give myself a preview um, that uh, we'll, we'll get to that slide here in, in, in a second but what I wanted to talk about a little bit it just to kind of set the table for this arching overarching conversation a bit is um, what what are your kind of general observations that you've seen uh, over the course of the year and uh, uh, at, at your various interactions and, and what I'll do is perhaps I'll just set the table a little bit um, around what I've been seeing. Uh, and I, I kind of gave a little bit of a sneak preview, but um, this year at 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 both KubeCon uh, as well as what I've been reading in the in the press and media is there's there's just been a, a large uh, kind of transition around uh, talking about DevOps specifically as as the primary um, world in which uh, Kubernetes operates within, and and more of a, a bit of a focus towards platform engineering. And what does that effectively mean? And the way I kind of an analyze it and think about it is that uh, platform engineering is a representation of, of taking all the elements uh, of, of the development space and, 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 the, and then the operational component and, and really formalizing it much more uh, uh, robustly. And, and it's, it's a sign of maturation. Uh, when you're talking about a platform, it needs to be consistent. It needs to be reliable. Uh, it needs to be something that uh, can be uh, self-service in order to service the cloud native uh, functions. And as a result of that, um, that's that was a big focus of a lot of uh, conferences that I saw and, and interactions that I've seen with customers. There's less uh, kicking of the tires and less conversations around what what can I do with this this technology and movement towards containerization. And instead, what are the practices that I need to do in order to become really more formalized? So outside of you know platform engineering is the big one, um, and then outside of that, um, there's other trends that I saw in general around um, a lot of conversation around AI and ML, and we'll talk about a little bit that, about that. Um, the vast diversity of use cases. I mean, I've had customers just completely blow my mind in terms of the use cases that they've talked about. Um, one of the most interesting ones that I I just I walked into a, an, an executive briefing in Texas. And I just was completely floored by the fact that a meat processor was planning on putting GPUs in each of their factories in order to drive optimal efficiency of of of, uh, of, of trimming of meat off of the off of the bones of 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 the, of the processing plant. That's just an application in my mind. I, when I walked into the conference, I never would have thought about that. Uh, that's an edge use case driving back to a core 
Uh, you know, we've got other scenarios where customers are want to test things out, the public cloud, move back into production. Uh, it's just really Kubernetes is, is literally everywhere in any imaginable use case that you can uh, that you can come up with. And then finally, as people talk about all these different use cases, um, there's a, a, a strong um, outcome from the platform engineering focus to find defined uh, paved roads, as Gartner refers to it, or golden pathways. Uh, this notion has been around within the industry for for several years, but it's um, I think it's it's something now that um, because you know if I heard correctly in Chicago, I heard many folks talking about. Uh, Kubernetes effectively having its Linux moment of mainstream adoption uh, that the re everybody's arrived, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so those are just some of the things that I saw over the course of the year, obviously that I could I can drive into more customer anecdotes. And uh, for those of you uh, attending the webinar, if, if that's something that you'd like uh, J.O. and I to talk further about um, giving you more anecdotes around those use cases, we can certainly do so as the conversation evolves. But Jay, I'd love to get your thoughts uh, now that I've, I've kind of laid out um, at least the framework of what I've mm -hmm. seen. Uh, what are you What are you seeing out there? Well, I mean, it's great that we've seen. I think we expect the like the NVIDIA GPU, you know, computer vision to be in the manufacturing of a you know electric car. Right. We, we have those use cases, right. Where it's yes. like looking at the parts and making sure it's doing Q and a having that technology go all the way to a, you know, a meat processing plant to make sure that you, you, didn't, right you didn't think there'd be butcher efficiency as part of the, yeah, AI exactly. Use like, I mean, that, yeah. that is great to me. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I enjoy that. So that, that's good. Um, I probably in the last year have spent more time because, you know, if anyone's noticed, like, um, gen AI has become a big deal. Um, yes. <laughs> and so, you know, beyond, you know, just not beating the platform engineering thing to death, but that is a big, that is a big deal for, for us and the customers we talk to and, and about building that, building your platform as a product now, like you're, you're actually product managing that platform that you're delivering to developers or to the, to the business in order to, to do that, doing that in a way it's kind of graduated DevOps into, into that. And that's definitely a top thing that we've seen across our customers uh, over the last year. Now, um, while that was happening, right. <laughs> is this is, is around gen AI and around what, what do we need to do? Um, what do we need to do in order to, um, take advantage of that. Now you can see at, and at some of the follow-up blog posts that I've read, you know, at KubeCon, they, there was a plenty of, if you put it on that slide, even there was plenty of yep. sessions or things mentioning AI. Now it was mostly, you know, to the kind of maybe disappointment of some, like, it wasn't like how to run an LLM or like what models we're going to build with Kubernetes. It wasn't that deep. Right. Yeah. I, I would think agree. we're all yeah. still like, this is emerging for us infrastructure devops platform engineering teams we're not data scientists um, i would guess that you know of of the number of people that are on right with it's not like the ml engineers that have joined this call but we're all interested it is something that is technically very very challenging and, and cool and so there's a lot about it but yeah. um it's still very in the surface of like how do we deliver that how do we you know how do we maybe give a platform for developers to touch it, you know, maybe, you know, write Python against the API APIs and stuff to talk to um, different um, LLMs, those types of things. So that I think we're getting there. So, but this next year we're going to, you know, it's not going to go away that yeah, you look I, at the amount of investment that has gone into it. <laughs> um, you know, just mo Microsoft is invested alone is enough to, you know, keep this alive for a long, long time. This is not going to disappear. So that's, that's one of my top things for this next year in 24. It, maybe we can just pause for that for a moment because I think it's forefront of mind for for a lot of different people. And so, what I wanted to kind of elaborate a little bit on is that um, I think you're you're right. If you take a look at the the content sessions and if we think about what the keynote was uh, at at KubeCon, um, the conversation really mostly focused at uh, around using Kubernetes specifically as an infrastructure platform to deliver AI and ML for environments to allow it to scale more easily. Or in the case of what I was talking about in that meat processing use case, being able to have elements of, of, of the training data and learning data 
be represented out in the edge and then being able to stretch a cluster or stretch your message queuing systems uh, to be able to feed into a centralized data lake that's adjacent to a GPU. Of course, Kubernetes is going to be great for that. But, um, you know, I think to your point, um, and for us as, as, a, as a company that sells a, a product to the consumer market, um, we, we, we all know that Kubernetes is, is, is pretty challenging. And I think there's a lot of promise around being able to leverage AI and ML and certain aspects of, of monitoring observability and then driving um, proactive uh, approaches. Uh, you know, that's something I know that, um, you know, most of the vendors and in, including ourselves have started to introduce uh, LLMs it, to drive better things around how to how do I do this it, with a product? You know, how do I set up a uh, a data protection strategy for a multi-node Mongo environment in Portwork Data Services, for example? Or uh, how do I uh, do X Y Z? And and you can leverage uh, AI models to do that. Well, that's just scratching the surface. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my hope is that over the course of the, this year. We're going to see a lot more um, robust mechanisms um, that that help drive these. But also, um, at the at the end of the day, we've got to remember that Kubernetes was primarily, uh, you know, something that's been really really helpful for the developers themselves. And so, I'm hoping that we can see more uh, orientation around acceleration of of uh, of developer work. And I know that there's a couple startups out there that are specifically focused on this, and they're probably there's a lot of running. like help yeah. help me write better code. Um, yes, exactly. LLMs out there. Um, for me, it's yeah. like everything I do is probably needs better code. So, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> for me, I need that every single day of my life. Um, but uh, another big thing on that too is um, when we come back, if we bring it back to like the title, right? Data on Kubernetes is that yeah. the AI, any AI model that you are working with, right? I would say, and I would love to someone in the in the group here to put it into the Q and A or in the chat. Um, most of us are not building or work for a place that's building a brand, you know, brand new LLM or brand new Gen AI model. What we're doing is we're building tools to take advantage of that, right? And that's what right, right. that's what the data on Kubernetes on Kubernetes is going to enable for the um, population, for the general population of everyone out there, is. For this year, you know, it, you're going to be building a tool that that takes, you know, your logs from Kubernetes or your logs from your um, application, um, you know, uh, monitoring, and be able to spot anomalies or to look look at things and run it through a pre-trained model and get inference out of it. Um, and so, you know what I mean? Like, and I would say like, so if someone's out there and is like, no, no, we're I'm going to take Kubernetes, I'm going to I'm going to build. I'm going to rebuild chat GPT, you know, internally, that's, that's way cool. And there's a, few, there's a handful of people out there that are going to do that. But I would say for most of us is like, how do I get this in the hands of my developers in a way that's right. going to help me? You know, if I'm a platform engineer, I'm going to be using it to, you know, automate, you know, how do, how do I connect these systems? How do I, you know, correlate the data between them in a way that can uh, shorten downtime, shorten, um, time to market for other, you know, innovation for my actual product that I'm releasing. It's, it's mm -hmm. going to be the, the sky's the limit on the way that we can think about it. Like, you know, if you think if someone thought of putting a GPU in, in the meat, in the meat processing plant, think of what you could do, <laughs> right. <laughs> for, for your business. Agreed. So. Agreed. Agreed. Well, um, you know, one thing that I also, I, I do see uh, kind of a correlation between the, the, the sessions uh, that data that we have in front of us is that, We'll probably see uh, AI uh, very prevalent in some of the security components, uh, and that's a big trend that we continue to see. It is uh, as more and more stateful workloads uh, that represent tier zero and tier one production-worthy uh, classes of data, um, you know, whether it's advanced uh, fraud detection analysis data or whether it's uh, data warehouse and analytics workloads, um, the days in the past where uh, those these environments have been around for a while, but even the, the administrators of them might not have classified them as a stateful workload because it was a load, a process, and then a discard. Um, you know, I think the 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 bar is set a little bit higher now, um, and that uh, customers don't necessarily want to have to go through an entirety of a reload process or or other elements. They they want that data to be available to them. But even outside of all that. Um, 
you still have to have in consideration the architectural requirements to do some of these um, large scale uh, data processing components. It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I have an infrastructure background prior to coming into this space. And so I, I feel my, my somewhat apathy uh, storage muscles being rebuilt as I'm having to think about like, well, hey, you know, I probably need to think about uh, how many transactions per seconds is this? What's the throughput requirement? Uh, you know, I might need to think about uh, the cost effectiveness of, of cost effectiveness of running this potentially in our AWS instances. And instead, maybe maybe I should run it local in my more cost-effective uh, NVMe-based uh, uh, DAS uh, server farm that I have uh, in my lab. Uh, and and you know, you and I we we're 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 privileged to have a variety of different options uh, for us to leverage. So we can have that flexibility. But I do think it it it, it drives to it. So um, anyway, I just want to make sure I did highlight uh, the other trend, which was uh, obviously security. So um, the big trends we're hitting on are our AI. Uh, security and of course uh, the data on Kubernetes component. So um, let's see. Um, we were moving on a little bit further uh, in into the uh, content here a little bit. Um, uh, let's see what what other um, what other uh, generic or general trends have you seen uh, that perhaps we haven't touched base here with Jo? I've got I've got one more in my mind, but I'll I'll cede the floor to you uh, here. I have here two more first. for everyone who okay. I'm interested is okay. if you go if you want to go up two slide or a couple of slides it's, i think it's the it you'll see uh, there's a couple of articles that came out in since the new year or one was maybe right at the end of the end of the year go to the next slide there you go is um this one yeah this this is a oh, slight yeah, change yeah. and and i think this is something we're all going to think about and and consider over the next uh year is yeah uh Broadcom and VMR, if you go to the next slide too. So this is this article, if you read it from CRN, we can send the links if anyone's interested in it is, and you can look, or you could Google it and find it, um, is, yep. is changing the way they do business is the best way to put it. And it's not what everyone's used to. And if you read this article in, in particular, I'm J Fred, I'm, I'm very, uh, interested to hear your take on it as well is the customer or the partner that, that said, this is, Hey, we're, we're not going anywhere because we are so we're all of our automation tools and maybe, you know, some of, some of you all that are here on the, on the Q and a can put in is, um, you know, how much of your tooling is built specifically for VMware and vSphere and how hard would it be to back out of that? Right. And I think that is a question we're all going to ask this year. This is a, obviously something that we're very interested in as a, we provide data on Kubernetes, which, you know, you can manage VMs in Kubernetes. It's going to be, that's going to be a topic. It's, you know, it's a fairly new thing. Um, yeah. Not everyone's used to that. You're not going to get all the bells and whistles you did from VMware, but right. I think there's going to be a lot of discussions. The technical teams may say, Hey, no. So like you, you look at my, my platform engineering team, I've already built, Terraform to go and build VMs. I'm not redoing that for a kubevert or OpenShift virtualization or some of the other landing spaces right. out there. Um, what, you know, but um, I think everyone should be prepared on and be prepared to see, um, to answer that question. Cause someone's got in your organization is going to ask like, what should we do about this? Do we need to change? And some of it may be, you know, and it's a completely valid answer to say, yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna stick with it. Like, if the price went up, if it does this, it's so important to what we do. We're staying this way, but also, how do we how do we make that decision? What's the smart way to go about this over the next year? And this is gonna be a big topic in twenty four. Fantastic. Um, that makes a ton of sense, uh, Jo, to me. Actually, I look at it in in terms of in my my customer interactions are all highlighting the same thing, uh, even before the CRN uh, articles came out, um, and. I kind of look at it in a couple of different angles or a couple of different slices. One slice is that uh, ISVs and software vendors, if we, if we even go into uh, some of the uh, financial services industry or even in state and local and education uh, and uh, uh, areas, I'm seeing software vendors go to their customers and say, hey, the next generation of your platform needs to be uh, running on Kubernetes. Uh, or we're, we're developing the next generation of the software you're using. It's going to run on Kubernetes. So uh, get your environment up and running. And so a lot of customers, uh, especially in that space, that haven't had, they're not early adopters of this space. And so 
um, their first inclination has been historically just to run um, a, a, a Kubernetes distro on top of a virtualization, a hypervisor, uh, on top of predominantly VMware. Um, so there has already been a little bit of groundswell of interest around, hey, I need to move to towards uh, uh, towards Kubernetes-based workflows. Um, so that's one data point. The second data point is, well, if I'm going here, do I really need a hypervisor underneath of it? Um, so there's a, a pool of, of customers that are in that category that have, the, the light bulb has gone off and said, hey, I could run Kubernetes on bare metal. Uh, why do I need to have another abstraction layer? Kubernetes, uh, this is actually uh, highlights one of the questions in the chat. Uh, Kubernetes about uh, via cloud. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Kubernetes, by by uh, by virtue of its uh, cloud native design, uh, builds in parity in its construct in the first place. Um, and so, when we talk about where uh, where things are needed from a backup perspective, it's uh, sometimes it's needed for uh, disaster recovery and high availability if it's beyond the uh, blast radius. Like a, a Kubernetes cluster can't natively stretch beyond five milliseconds. And so, you need a product like a Portworks to come in to to kind of stretch beyond that. So we could provide DRHA, but if you're in a in a in a metro region and you have two clusters below five milliseconds, yes, you can have you can have some some uh, parity and failover capabilities uh, natively in Kubernetes from that that regard. Um, but anyway, so so that's the the second paradigm was those who figured out like, hey, I could just do this all with Kubernetes. And then there's the last section of folks, and this is the one that's really rapidly accelerating. And 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 this is where, you know, one could almost almost. I mean, we're not going to go too far. But you could almost feel sorry for Broadcom, um, and that they came into the marketplace to take over uh, 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 VMware at the exact same moment as there's a point of inflection for people to move away from it at the exact same time. And so uh, it's a it's a tough uh, road that they've established for themselves to really kind of drive increasing um, enterprise license agreement costs uh, for customers. While at the same time, customers are already evaluating uh, what we refer to as kind of VMware or virtualization off ramps. And that in particular, um, I was at Gartner the year before last, uh, you know, in 2022. And, you know, Kubernetes was a discussion point. There was a fair amount there, but for the most part, it was very infrastructure focused. This year, there was a ton of conversation around, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about this Kubert thing. What can you tell me about Kubert, and can I can I use this to help help me get off of off of VMware? And the answer is absolutely you can. Uh, it's just not ready with all the bells and whistles. You're going to need to look for a different kind of golden path or paved road that addresses not only the enterprise reliability for the stateful workload, uh, but also um, uh, the uh, the ability to mimic functions uh, from the vRail i suite, specifically storage vMotion uh, and uh, uh, compute, you know, the elements of the vMotion of the images themselves. Uh, so those are things that um, are kind of creating a perfect storm for a lot of the the uh, conversation specifically around around KubeVert. Uh, maybe one of the things that we can do as well is we can give some more information around uh, KubeVert here in, the, in our follow-up as well, uh, maybe some handouts mm -hmm. as well as we follow up. But So that was one of them, um, and that was really great. What, what was the second one that you had? So if you go on the next one too, there was a, so this is, you know, a little bit self-serving, but I think it's, there's a bigger trend in this is, um, so IDC, yeah. Right, they they do this uh, marketscape. They they analyze. They're an analyst firm, just like you know, J Justin has mentioned Gartner a few times, but they they looked at hey, you know what uh, you know, what data management within containers, and they published a report on that for the first time at the end of last year. And so while you know we talk about like I talk about it all day, um, data on Kubernetes. And Justin talks about it all day and we, we work with teams that that's all they do. Right. Um, it's good to see outside of our, our, our little, the room we sit in, I won't call it a bubble. Mm -hmm. It's not really a bubble. The room we sit in that it's getting recognized. Right. Um, obviously we, we, we did well in the report. It's something we've, we've been aiming at for the last six years, but like, it's good to see that so that, for those of us that are out there on in the in the DevOps in the platform engineering world, and we're saying, "Hey, um, we're we've been moving into Kubernetes. I've been told that there's ways to do data on Kubernetes. I, I want to do this. Um, 
know now that like this is this is the trend is is take the train has left the station i don't know the best way to put this right like it is going it you're it's not stopping um when once these these anal- like if it's something like emerging trend they put it in a report to see you know emerging things that might happen in 10 years right like they have you know gartner and idc both have reports like that what is what is key is like with this 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 shows that there's enough interest for them to to publish this so that because they're i mean their customers pay for this they pay for this information right. to help them decide what to do and you know that that is an amazing step forward when it comes to evaluating the solutions that deliver to deliver these and so obviously we're one of them right and and that's great but for everyone out there it's like you don't have to think that you know i'm setting the the trend right the risk is is disappearing when it comes to um, delivering your systems your workloads this way um when you when you see something like this so it's yes i'd love for everyone to go download this and and <laughs> and read all about it right that's great but at the same time like know that like if you are already doing it or if you're moving towards this that that it's now i would say it is mainstream that would be my claim of the day like people can argue with me they can you know whatever that would be great but this is now a mainstream thing this is no longer a emerging trend this is a cool this is something that is going to be a big deal in 24. oh for for sure um i think that kind of dovetails to my original statement at the beginning which is um data on kubernetes is no longer a point for debate or discussion uh it's arrived it's here uh similar Mm -hmm. to kubernetes has arrived and it's here uh and it's it's it we're in this you know, if the fact that you and I are on this call right now is, is to some degree a reflection of the mainstream nature, nature of this. Uh, you know, we're both uh, old storage propeller heads and saw the emerging trends a couple of years ago and started to, to jump on board. Um, but if, if, if us storage dinosaurs are, are, are on this path and, and emerging and, and creating new space, uh, you can guarantee that others are as well. Um, so uh, apologies if there's any background noise there. Um, I did have uh, one other uh, trend that I kind of wanted to talk about. I, I did touch base with it briefly with regards to the conversation around uh, platform engineering. Um, and I was kind of leaving it towards the, you know, the industry definition of what, what platform engineering really represents. But I do think it's, it's important to note that we're going to see in the vendor ecosystem um, uh, a little bit of a platformification. Uh, everybody's going to talk about uh, their product specifically of as a platform to varying degrees of success. Um, and I think one of the, you know, the unique characteristics of Portworx is that we have a viable claim to that uh, particular uh, moniker uh, because we, we are a platform of sorts that not only provides storage, but um, security, disaster recovery, um, migration, backups, things of that nature. But I do think that um, we're gonna see more marketing from all the vendors out there uh, re- re- reflecting this uh, transition from uh, a less, uh, an, a more nebulous description around DevOps. Um, you can go and ask uh, 30 people on the street what DevOps means, and you might get, you know, 22 different answers. Um, but with platform engineering, you get a little bit more consistency of responses, maybe not necessarily oriented as, as closely towards Kubernetes as it should be, uh, but they at least have an, a, a conceptual understanding of, of what it means. Um, but I think that that, that because of that, you'll, you're going to see more vendors and various uh, entities uh, claiming the title of, of a platform. Um, and I, I think, you know, from a consumer perspective, um, that may be a little bit challenging. But I think as long as the individuals in question, when they're doing their research, are asking themselves the really important question, well, what does this do for my environment? How does it solve what I need to solve? And uh, in the case of of what I'm seeing out in the customers uh, and and, in my interactions at at various conferences is that there are really, really key needs that customers are continuing to have around the need for uh, data portability, data sovereignty, uh, multi-cloud functionality, edge to core, core to cloud. Um, These are things that that really are are starting to become more mainstream uh, as we start with customers. And maybe one of the areas that I, I, I've seen uh, continue to be a discussion point, the most obvious one that, that jumps out to customers is, is really about backup. Um, and and they're starting, customers are starting to come back and say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't really truly have 
stateful workloads in the way that you're describing them. I, I may have had some some data that was occupying storage in my environment as it moved from say right to left uh, in, in my data processing uh, uh, component. But now customers are in a production sense of starting to move um, SaaS platforms to be Kubernetes based. And so there's really a, a key drive around, around needing reliable Kubernetes native backup. Um, and is, is, is that something that that you're seeing in the in the top three things that you, when you have a customer meeting, because I know it is for me. Uh, there isn't a conversation that goes by after you know we we talk about Portworx Enterprise and what it does from a storage perspective, but you know towards the tail end of the meeting, there's always a hey, and of course we need to back this up. Uh, are you seeing that mm -hmm. same same component as well? Um, yeah, for for a little bit too, because and I spend a lot of time talking about our database as a service stuff as well. And so it's kind of built in, right? Like we, you know, so it's almost that question doesn't get answered, answered, you know, asked as much for uh, at least the meetings that I go to, you know, to, yeah. you know, just as so everyone knows, I don't sit in the room with uh, Justin all the time, <laughs> but yeah. So what I see is a lot is, you know, Hey, of course, that's just expected. Like in our data, you know, in PDS, the database as a service platform, right? Like it, it runs on Kubernetes, but it has, back back it's just built in right it's expected um right and and the fact that yeah people when you're building it yourself yeah you need to put that on you it, it, it's a requirement so when we talk about that like yes we see here a lot about and i think i just made the apple camera do something funny um <laughs> you, made, you made it to give him a thumbs up so yes, the ai which is fine you, too you yes that was yeah, the ai exactly. was watching me um yeah but the the the, the, it is, yeah, people need to do that. They ask that a lot. The the other thing I get, I see in those conversations is um, how do I make this run in on-premises and in the cloud or, right, where it's multi, like, talk about that. Um, if, if you've heard or seen that is how do I do, you know, hybrid, multi-cloud, like choosing yeah. a single platform doesn't seem to be, um, the the first thing i hear anymore that's that's kind of one of the other things that i i put out there it's like hey we we run in these three places or these two places it's it's always that well i mean i think i started the conversation as well with the, the future truly is hybrid um but not necessarily in the way that i framed it at the beginning of the conversation um the, the, one of the key drivers around the hybrid nature of where we're going is where does it drive the best uh, outcome for the customer with the right uh, cost efficiency. And um, w I'll give you an example. Um, there was a SaaS company that I was interacting with that uh, really, really felt um, at some point in the development of their platform that it was super important for them to have uh, a robust observability and monitoring uh, 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 platform using uh, managed open search service on AWS. And uh, that really solved a key uh, reliability. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining it's their SRE team that was was feeling that it was really important for them to run this for their SaaS offering. And the um, the price after six months blew them away. And uh, so they quickly realized, hey, we can't just use a hosted data service uh, for this types of functionality. Uh, this is core and central to our money making SaaS platform. There's got to be a cloud native capacity or capability for me to do this. And so to improve the margins on their SaaS platform, um, they first started looking uh, to us to help them provide at scale uh, just open source, open search uh, on top of, uh, in this case, it was EKS, uh, but it could have been GKE or it could have been AKS for that matter. Um, and then there was also discussion for, by that customer because they were also considering moving other aspects of their SaaS platform into a private uh, hosted colo. And in that decision tree, they were also evaluating, um, for those of you un unaware, uh, open search is just a, an earlier fork off of Elastic. And so they they went back to the drawing board and said, well, should I just use uh, you know Elastic or should I use this fork version of open search? Which, which one should I use? Um, and which one should I start building on prem? And um, you know what what products like Portworks can really help facilitate is making data portability and stretching of your clusters between two two physical locations 
it just simply streamlines the process by which a platform engineer can decide where to continue to grow and scale the platform. Does it need to be uh, using an expensive hosted data service uh, and, and, or, or can I just build it on-prem? The other element around that, and you know, I hit on cost a little bit, but even for more vanilla workloads, say I'm a SaaS platform and um, I built the architecture initially uh, on, on a variety of uh, components in EKS, as well as data services that are hosted there, uh, you know, that are serviced in RDS or, or other components. Um, or, so I built it that way. Now, how do I transform that product to be able to run on AKS or GKE um, to be more cost efficient or to service other regions in the world? Or perhaps I'm going into a, a location where those aren't those locations. How am I gonna drive that on-prem? And so one of the things that we've been able to help customers with is uh, simply using native Kubernetes or vanilla Kubernetes, or just using the basic frameworks of Kubernetes and less of the uh, specific data services, because you know we, we give that op option and capability. And when you're using a common framework on top of a, a Kubernetes distro with, with portworks and, and elements of data services, that means that your tooling and all your automation and all the elements that you're using to service that environment, they're gonna be the same on-prem as they are gonna be in AWS. And the AWS environment is gonna look the same as the, uh, as the Google environment. And if you don't do that and instead use the different data services with different uh, role-based authentication controls and uh, different network meshes that you have to work with and different, you know, it, the variations, uh, start to, to add up. And for the platform engineer, instead of him really managing one cohesive environment that, that operates the same with the same orchestration across three different uh, heterogeneous environments, uh, if they don't uh, do it natively on Kubernetes and start using the data services, they really have three bespoke SaaS products that they're managing. And that's a, that's a conundrum that I am seeing multiple customers uh, come up against and they're looking for ways uh, to simplify that architecture. And, uh, and that's why I'm honored to say that, you know, if, if we're in the right situations with those customers, um, you know, what we provide from a stateful storage perspective can help those customers um, create their own unique paved road for their SaaS offering that mm -hmm. is paved all the way across uh, the different clouds and your private mm -hmm. colo. So it's, that's exciting for us. Um, I, I, there isn't a lot of other vendors out there that are able to, to accomplish that today. So uh, it's kind of interesting. So there's a couple of questions that popped in if we want to pivot yeah. a little bit. Um, I'm going to yeah. throw this because yeah, I want to hit this button. I want to hit this button that I learned about today. From Ooh, Rich. nice. What is the next yeah. tech, tech, tech trend? Wow, that's a hard word. Um, that could start to displace Kubernetes. So I have an answer to that. Um, Jay, Fred, do you want to answer? First. I I have one too. Um, if you don't mind, I'd I'd love to uh, spout my, on mine. And um, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna riff off of something that I that I learned at at at, at KubeCon, and and um, I think it actually makes sense. And that is, if Kubernetes, as presented by the CNCF, if all the SIGs were closed and and uh, we completed all the work and it was all done, and it looked like everything was done with Kubernetes. I think that there would absolutely be a trend in the next year or two or three um, that would displace Kubernetes as the de facto uh, container uh, management uh, approach that customers are using. Um, but the reality is, is that Kubernetes is will never be done. It's always evolving by the nature of the CNCF. And by virtue of that ever evolving uh, design by being open source and, and community based from a contribution perspective, I just can't see everybody giving up on it uh, because it's the most uh, transformative and flexible architecture. If you need something, you just spin up an SIG to start uh, driving it towards it. Now, by contrast, if it were closed, i.e. like if we look back to the origination of where we came from, Docker was more closed. Uh, and as a result, it ceded territory to Kubernetes effectively. And so that's my answer is that I, I don't know that there will be anything because Kubernetes itself isn't a, a, a fixed product and it will continue to evolve as people go. Now, granted, mm -hmm. the one, one underlying 
limiter to my uh, my theory here is that Kubernetes, is, it is complex. So if somebody comes along and is able to do all this with a really, really pretty bow and wrapper to make it infinitely easier than it is today, well, then I take everything back and you know somebody else will come into the marketplace. Uh, so anyway, those are my thoughts. What about you, J.O.? So my, my, when I saw this, what I thought about was I don't compile my Linux kernel anymore, right? Like I just get one <laughs> and I think, <laughs> you know, I get Red Hat, I get Ubuntu, right. And just, or uh, Amazon and just go, right? I, right. Some people out there, maybe you guys are like still hardcore, true Linux people and you just do it yourself. I don't, right. I just admit it. I'll put my hand up. And yeah. Um, when I see that question though, I think like there, there will be a time not 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 necessarily displacing Kubernetes. But there'll be a time where it'll be invisible. Like it'll be underlying, it'll orchestrate workloads, but there'll be, there, there may be a product that goes on top of it that will um, kind of make it more invisible. Right. And, and I think that's even a stated goal of some of the people that work on Kubernetes is make it as invisible as possible. Which one of those things is what you got to is making it a ton more easier for everyone, yeah. for everyone to use. But um, as you see, like there'll be SaaS products you in that'll, that's what's what will eventually happen 10 years from now is instead of me building that, I may just get it in SaaS, which might run, be running it on Kubernetes or whatever, evolution of kubernetes exists 10 years from now right yeah so that's that's kind of my thought is and i i because I, I just thought that in my mind i was like you know right now i do a lot of like yaml files and i build you know kube vanilla and i do all kinds of cool things like that but you know i don't i don't recompile um linux from scratch anymore I mean, and and say too that like, i don't think apps running on linux are gonna are gonna disappear anytime soon good stuff good stuff um, we have one more question. Um, is it, do I click the, uh, publish one? Is that what brings it to the mainstream or what's, what's, what's the trick? You go ahead and do it the, for the next question. Oh, do you want it to pop up? Yeah, you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, all right. Is there a common CNCF management product to manage the platform? Do you see a need for one? Hmm. It's a pretty good question. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? So there's there's a there's a few pr uh, projects and a few vendors out there that are aiming to do like a uh, like what I picture when I see this question is a manager of managers something that I can I can dashboard or see all of my Kubernetes in lots of different places. Um, there's some projects, some open source stuff to do that. Red Hat has a product. Rancher, you know what I mean? There's a lot of vendors. Rancher has a product that tries to bring all those into one umbrella so you can kind of see them and observe them together. Um, but I don't, and I do see a need for that because one of our customers, they have 6,000 Kubernetes clusters. And who wants to manage that one at a time? So there's definitely a need for, the, for that, bringing that together. And I, I mean, that's, that is why, you know, someone as big as Red Hat is working so hard on do, on, on those kind of things. Um, you know, I don't think uh, Portworx will be comprehensive across this board, but we'd certainly like to make the overall management uh, uh, journey easier. Um, and, you know, to your point about uh, multiple clusters, that is one of the key components of our of our design is that, you know, we, we, we host a little uh, key value database that keeps track of all the clusters that you want to have as part of your overall Portworx environment. Um, and that Portworx environment could have, you know, five different disparate Kubernetes distro types in there. You know, uh, you can have all three of the hyperscalers and, and, and two flavors of on-prem Kubernetes. Uh, and that, that's, that's one of the things that we certainly as a company uh, value. Uh, so it's not really a CNCF uh, product, but it's uh, it's, it's a vision that between either SIG pro uh, groups uh, or vendors such as ourselves, we'll, we'll probably see some collapsing of the gaps in, in that regard. Um, and, um, there was one other thing that I read uh, as we talk about um, where where the products are going is that um, I saw somebody put in a blog post. There's gold in them dar hills, and and so yeah, there is a little bit of a gold rush, uh, so to speak, from a variety of vendors trying to figure out um, how can they close the gaps um, that aren't being specifically addressed in an open source manner uh, via the CNCF and SIGs, and can they go in and 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 you know, effectively uh, capture the need within the marketplace. Uh, but, 
you know, it's a risky endeavor for, for many customers because, or for many companies in that area, because the open source nature of the CNCF could be like, well, you know, we, we this SIG was so promising that, uh, that it, that actually covered it even better. So, um, let me throw up. We have a few more questions. Let's get, get yeah, we got a few more. Yeah. Guys, I like AI... answering questions way better. Right. Yeah, me too. Um, beyond make AI make Kubernetes easier. Like I think the sky's the limit on that. Right. Uh, obviously it can be a lot more, <laughs> a lot more simple, but even finding like, just imagine in my head uh, is best practices. Like the things that you should, you know, that you may learn the hard way by doing it yourself. Uh, building an AI that could actually help you not make those mistakes <laughs> and make Kubernetes easier, right? Like, hey, uh, don't, you know, don't run, you know, on nodes with no internal storage because there's, there is internal logging and those fill up, the nodes crash. Like, unless you've done it, you may not have read that um, article before, right? <laughs> and so there's lots of little things like that. How, how about you, J. Fred? Anything to add, add to that one? Yeah, I, you know, for me in particular, it, it comes around uh, reliability, enterprise reliability and production readiness um, and mm -hmm. using AI to do relatively mundane things uh, in various levels of, of the product. So we talked a bit about there being a, a paved road or golden pathways, but well, that implies that there's three or four different vendors uh, interacting in order to create your overall environment. And so we do sometimes see interoperability issues where a customer will just not really be thinking about um, the Kubernetes environment and they'll go and upgrade their, their vSphere environment, uh, which in turn up, up, updates either components of their vVol's uh, underlying storage or their VMFS structure, which in turn kicks the legs out underneath of their Kubernetes environment and just brings it all down. Um, you know, having elements of AI somewhere in the stack to go and check uh, for uh, interdependencies, compatibility requirements, and other components, um, it, it's all manual today. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for elements of, of AI to kind of close the gaps on those components. Um, I also think that just in general, the pace and velocity by which we see uh, updates and improvements uh, and, and closing of critical vulnerabilities is going to be aided and augmented um, uh, by introduction introduction of AI to kind of keep keep up to speed and keep the tabs on those types of components. So, um, you know, that's where I think it will ha has the promise to close the gap above and beyond the the kind of like table stakes of the chatbot that everybody seems to have already. I love good uh, chatbot you know. though. Good, a good, a good chatbot's good, yeah. But uh, I'm gonna it, throw this one good. because there's another yeah. AI question. I want to break the AI questions up, right? So, sure. Um, yeah. What do you think virtual cluster? I would think of virtual cluster in Kubernetes. Will it replace the namespace separation? I don't think it. I don't think namespaces will go away because that's kind of like a Linux thing, right? Like that. Yeah. It, that construct is there. But I love the idea of virtual cluster. And we've done some work with vCluster, that that project. And um, I think Loft is the company that that helps manage that as well. They have like yeah. a, a pay for product to manage that as well. And I, I love the idea of a virtual cluster. Um, obviously, we, you know, Portworx does something where you can actually get storage within those virtual clusters that's, you know, separate and secure for you and your, your virtual clusters. It's absolutely, we have customers doing it. Um, I feel like it's a great idea. I don't know if it'll replace namespaces, but as a as a um, delineation point for security, I think it's way better than namespaces. A hundred percent, because it's it's more comprehensive, and um, you know the primary customer that we've been working on with this is 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 a SaaS customer, and they're seeing the benefits associated from an operational and efficiency standpoint, as well as just creating a segregation. You know, uh, if if we think about outside of Kubernetes, if, if I lean on some of my old selling expertise in, in just the traditional infrastructure space, there are many, many um, SaaS architectures that were built on a share nothing design. Um, many of them are running in uh, very segregated uh, bare metal architectures. Uh, they might use some consolidation or some shared resources for the purposes of disaster recovery or backup, but because they're either um, HIPAA compliant or they're FedRAMP compliant. There's any number of reasons why they, the uh, customer environments need to be um, logically and in some cases physically segregated. And I think uh, virtual clusters offer an enormous amount of promise uh, to deliver 
um, that level of segregation to meet compliance and regulatory needs, um, but have it be uh, functional in, in, a, in, a, in a less uh, over-engineered manner. There's a lot of efficiencies associated with those SaaS designs where they're share nothing in, 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 in principle. And, and in many respects, that whole notion of share nothing is anathema and, and contrary to the whole promise of, of what Kubernetes brought to web scale uh, in the first place. So technologies like virtual cluster really kind of bridge the gap between those two philosophical differences and, and hopefully allow customers to be able to, uh, to, to get that what they need out of the architecture without having to resort to kind of uh, uh, rudimentary and, and, and very um, limiting elements of physical segregation. All right. And I think you know, we're getting almost there and this is the last one. And it kind of leans a little bit into what you were saying there around the shared nothing. It, um, how does generative AI impact Kubernetes sustainability in terms of data and cloud now? So I have a, I have a take on this. Uh, I'll let you answer first since I read the question. Um, wow. In the short term, um, I, my instinct is to say it's going backwards, um, just in terms of what people are using. <laughs> um, but I could be wrong. Uh, you know, just I, you know, just I'm thinking of the va massive GPU farms. Um, one of my colleagues had the privilege of going and seeing a, a data center for a large silicon manufacturer that's trying to think of different ways um, to service uh, to service the AI. Um, and you know, right now the the drive is is around these specific GPUs that just have enormous power and cooling requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if and we, we think about the applications that are where some of these GPUs are not necessarily being used in AI, but they're using in, in, in cryptocurrency generation. And, and, and those types of farms uh, are enormously uh, resource intensive, but I, I think I may be missing the, the, the gestalt or the thrust of the, of the question. So maybe I'll, I'll defer to you and I'll modify my answer after I hear your answer. <laughs> well, I'll do this. Go to the slide that has the QR code too while we finish up. That way, if people are interested in that um, report, they can get that QR code. Yeah. But I think yeah. the way that I read this question was too, uh, kind of a little bit of what you were saying. Like I look at like um, OpenAI, Cohere, you know, um, some of the other AI companies, the investments they're getting. And like NVIDIA, you know, is giving them 100,000 GPUs, 20,000 GPUs at, at um, um, another one, right? And Microsoft is pr providing them with the infrastructure to run, you know, 100,000 servers. So like on the surface, it seems like it's going, it's going the wrong way. And I think it's what I'm, what I'm thinking, this is how I was going to answer the question is it's up to Kubernetes and the groups that are managing it to build in that efficiency. So when you're yes. talking about the shared nothing right. is um, Kubernetes manages that scheduling. Like I run a job, it grabs a GPU. Um, what we need to do is build towards, hey, um, how can I, you know, if I have 100,000, that's great. If I'm using 100,000 and they're, be, they're doing something productive for humanity, but if they're just sitting there, they're worthless, right? And they're just pulling right. power for nothing. Um, which is not good, <laughs> especially for sustainability. So um, I see is like, hey, how can Kubernetes be more efficient in order? So one, either if I have a hundred thousand, I use a ton more. Or how do I, you know, how do I get, how do I get that the production of a hundred thousand out of ten thousand right. or ten? Yeah, right. That's the goal. Is like, how do I shrink my footprint? Um, and there's going to be consolidation, like. You know, I remember taking my racks and racks of compact servers, and that's how long ago it was, and turning them into VMware. <laughs> right? There's going to be. I think there's going to be a drive for consolidation when it comes to that um, with 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 GPUs, because even if you're not someone building models, you need to use them um, to run your applications that leverage the models. So, um, and it's. I think it's up to Kubernetes to be efficient enough to make that worthwhile for everybody. I think that's a, that's that's a good analysis, and I, I I do think that it does change the elements of my answer too. Which is um, one of the promises of Kubernetes is that it does facilitate a, a, an enormous diversity of options in terms of how you can scale. And one of the things that you know I feel watching Nvidia with their immense growth and their uh, intense focus around the latest and greatest GPUs, 
uh, a lot of that is that the GPUs themselves are getting bigger and badder and, and more robust. And so that's great. But uh, but when you get a bigger and badder GPU, that just means that your data pipeline to service and feed that GPU uh, becomes a more voracious beast to have to manage. Kubernetes does a great job of scaling uh, to keep that GPU at 100% utilization. Uh, by the same token, Kubernetes and its ability to scale horizontally uh, and to, to drive into a design that could be massively parallel, I think there's opportunity within the compute space to figure out ways to take advantage of large amounts of distributed compute um, in less resource intensive manners than the most expensive million dollar GPUs from NVIDIA and maybe take advantage of lower commodity uh, uh, types of resources to um, you know, not necessarily need to crunch that information with the exact uh, speed and efficiency uh, but just arrive at that data information at, at a later point. Um, so it, it comes down to um, resource utilization optimization in general is, I guess, the theme that I, I would I would talk about. And that's what Kubernetes uh, could potentially enable on both directions, either making more use of the concentrated GPU uh, or open up the door for a type of distributed uh, 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 processing capability that, that we haven't seen uh, as a forefront. So I think we're at time and Cody's back. Cody is back. Uh, well, before I cut you guys off, I did want to let you talk about maybe what's on the screen with this QR code one, one final time. What do we got behind this code? Absolutely. So, this is, so oh, yeah, you, you go ahead, Dale. <laughs> no, you go ahead. You go ahead. This is trends trends in platform engineering. I feel like it would be um, of relevance to, to everyone out there um, and around where software engineering organizations are going. So you can, you can, you know, take a picture of this and, and uh, get access to this report right away. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, John, Justin, it's been such a pleasure having you guys with us today. Um, it's been an action packed hour. We've gotten lots of questions. So thank you to our audience for sending those in. Um, but most importantly, John, Justin, thank you both so much for joining us here on Tech Strong Learning. Thank you. All right, so before I release our audience, a uh, couple final reminders. We have been recording our session, so you will be receiving it via email here as soon as it becomes available. But you can also find it living on the Cloud Native Now website. That's cloudnativenow.com slash webinars, and you'll find it in the on-demand section. I'll be selecting two of our most engaged attendees to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So thank you for your chats and your questions, and to continue to become eligible please submit a post-webinar survey. That link is pinned at the top of the chat. Um, we would love to hear your feedback there. I'd like to thank Portworks for sponsoring our program today. And once again, to our audience, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you spending it here with us at TechStrong Learning, and we hope to see you at a future learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>